we're here today to discuss the Convit paper. Um, and we also have with us Stefani. He's he's um, joining us from Paris. Is that correct? Yep. Awesome. Um, so Stefani has been around. Uh, he's he's um, working as a researcher. Um, he's a PhD student who's who's working on deep learning, and he's jointly supervised by Gailo Broly and um, Levin Sagun. And he's studied theoretical physics and worked with NASA on black hole mergers, which is super exciting. Um, his re research focuses on understanding how deep neural networks are able to generalize um, despite being heavily overparameterized. And he's used tools from statistical mechanics to study simple models um, and try to understand when and why they overfit. And he also works on different types of inductive biases, affect how inductive biases affect learning um, from fully connected networks to convolution uh, networks to transformers. Um, He's, interest, he's also interested in bio-inspired alternatives to, to backpropagation. So I'm really, really excited to have you here with us, Stefan, today. Um, is that the correct way to pronounce your name? Is it Stefane or is it Stefan? Stefan, thank you. Stefan, oh, perfect. Um, no, thanks so much for finding the time for joining us today. Uh, so at Wits and Biases, we, we usually meet every week or bi-weekly and we discuss and dissect um, lots of papers. Um, and when I first read Convit, the paper in itself, the idea also seemed like something that's so interesting that we we had to discuss it at Weights and Biases. So thanks for finding the time for joining us um, today uh, and we'll be going through the paper with you. So thanks for that. Thank you, thanks a lot, pleasure. Cool. Um, so something that we'll be doing uh, as is usual with most, with almost our all of our paper reading groups is um, I do ask that we ask all our questions towards the end at onedb.me slash convert. I've just pasted that um, URL in chat as well. Uh, so this will bring us to, this will bring us to this page. Uh, the only reason why we host all our questions here and it's, it's um, towards the bottom, there's an option to write a comment um, and it is live. So I can go through these questions. And uh, the only reason why we host our questions here, we've done this for our fast book sessions, we've done this for our previous paper reading group sessions, um, is just because we're live on YouTube as well. So it's very hard for me to monitor the chat and it's very hard for me to um, have a look at these, at these multiple places to ask questions towards the end. Um, so when, when it's time to ask these questions, we'll, we'll go to this um, URL. Cool. Uh, with that being said, let's get started with the with the convert paper. Um, so, Stefan, do you want to uh, maybe uh, do a quick intro about the main idea and um, what exactly is convert and um, how different is it from the other vision transformers over there? Yeah, sure. So the main idea is pretty simple: is that uh, currently we have this sort of dilemma for practitioners between the convolutional networks and transformers and they're sort of on an opposite side of spectrum, uh, the spectrum being how much inductive bias you have. So CNNs have very strong inductive biases, uh, locality, weight sharing, and this makes them very effective when you don't have much data. And in some sense, you have a good prior. Um, but then when you have a lot of data, it's generally better to learn the inductive bias in a data-driven manner. And so, yeah, basically you have this, this, this dilemma and uh, there have been some approaches to try and find a compromise in this dilemma, typically using hybrid models. So basically stacking uh, some self-attention layers on a convolutional backbone. And that works really well. You generally have the best trade-offs in terms of speed accuracy. Um, but the problem with this is that it sort of induces a choice. Like um, you have to choose how many uh, convolutional layers versus how many um, self-attention layers. And that's obviously a very uh, task dependence thing. And so the, the simple idea bit behind the, uh, the convert is um, to basically learn how many layers should be convolutional from the data itself. So essentially start from the strong inductive bias um, configuration of a CNN in a sort of a devious way, which is initializing uh, transformer layers as CNN layers, and then giving freedom to the model to stay in the convolutional configuration, have much data, or to learn more general um, content-based attentions uh, if there is enough data. Yeah, um, excellent. Thanks for that. I think that really is an interesting, interesting idea. Um, so you mentioned inductive biases and um, just for the readers who are new to Convit and who are new to vision transformers, we have discussed uh, vision transformers previously before, um, but basically, uh, and 
uh, Stefan, feel free to correct me anytime. I'll, uh, as we go through the paper, I'll try and summarize it for um, everybody as, as, as we go along. Um, so as you said, when there's an input image, so let's just call this as my input image, um, and then there's this whole network. Um, so in CNNs, basically a convolutional neural network, what you have is you have uh, a lots of CNN blocks. So a ResNet would have four blocks of uh, varying numbers of convolution neural network layers, which is uh, pretty much convolution, batch norm, uh, and ReLU. And then that's when you get uh, the output here. Um, but Stefan, as you mentioned recently, there's this, there's this new line of research that has come out, uh, which instead of using CNNs throughout the whole network, uh, uses a hybrid hybrid architecture, and we saw this with the vision transformer as well, is that the early layers are a CNN and the later layers are a tension. Um, so far, so uh, good. So please feel free, feel free to um, interrupt me, Stefan. Um, but with Convit, uh, with Convit, how Convit is different is that these early layers, these early layers, so, um, in all the other architectures out there, when we have a look, um, we've we've it's pretty much a common pattern in the uh, recent research is that you have the early layers as a convolution convolutional layers, and then the later layers as attention layers. Um, but the way how convert is different is that your early layers are something called of G, are something called a GPCA layers. Um, and they have the option by themselves whether they want to stay CNN or they want to go towards the attention side of things. Um, so we'll also be discussing what's the difference in the two and why one is better than the other. Um, but so far, is that a is that a correct understanding and of in terms of the abstract of the paper? Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Um, so we'll just quickly go through the abstract. Um, Convolution architectures, as we know, have, have proven extremely useful for vision tasks. Um, they have something called a inductive bias. It, and, and the best things about um, the convolution neural networks are they're, they're more sample efficient, um, but they come at the cost of potentially lower performance ceiling. Um, so is the, over here, Stefan, does that mean that if we train for longer with more data, um, would the vision transformers have better performance compared to the convolutional neural networks? Um, yeah, so currently there's, a... um, yeah, there is a kind of war currently for state of the arts and it's hard to follow because every day there's a new model that beats the state of the art. So, uh, so yeah, you have these NF nets, which are the best available CNNs, which are pretty much on par with the, the deep transformers and stuff like that. So it's hard to say who's, but generally speaking, a model with less inductive bias uh, will generally be more powerful when you have infinite amount of data. It's going to learn the data and be inductive bias in an autonomous way. Mm, thank you. Yeah, that is correct. I do agree. Every week, this uh, somehow there's a new paper coming out, um, and I recently saw this CodeNet or this Kaiet or there's all these different papers that came in, coming out in Transformers world, and also then on the uh, convolution side of things, where it's hard to keep up as which one's going to eventually uh, have have a better. Uh, performance. Um, so in this, uh, I think just uh, for the audience who are new to the paper and haven't read it, um, the main thing that gets introduced as well is one of those is the gated positional sales for tension, the GPCA, uh, GPSA layer, which as I've mentioned, um, we, we can have a GPSA layer like this. So uh, at this point, then the main idea is to initialize the GPCA layers to mimic the locality of convolution layers. Um, from my understanding, I guess the understanding here is that these GPCA layers at beginning at the initialization, because we know from past research that it really helps to have the earlier layers as CNNs and the later layers as, as self-attention layers. Um, then based on my understanding, the GPCA, the GPSA layers at the beginning get initialized like a CNN, sort of be, start behaving like convolutional um, uh, neural networks and, and convolutional layers, and then the later ones are just just plain attention. Is that is that a is that a correct understanding? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, okay. to to be honest, the uh, the the uh, um, the architecture we use is actually twelve layers, and uh, uh, pretty much you could, in principle, use all the GPSA layers all along. The reason why we only use ten GPSA layers and then two. Uh, normal self attention layers is because it's easier to handle the, the class token with with usual uh, self attention. Um, but in principle, you could uh, you could use GPSA layers all along. 
essentially they're they're deciding all by themselves um, to to stay convolutional or not. So yeah. Right. So you mentioned the class token. So uh, by that do you mean um, so just as a recap for everybody, um, what happens is in, in terms of a transformer world, and this is just the vision transformer, is you have an input image that then gets divided into patches, and something that gets added to these patches is this uh, class token, which is this extra learnable um, class embedding. So what Stefan here is, I believe he's he's uh, referring to, is that that class token is easier to handle in these later layers if they're attention. Is that is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll probably explain the reason later, but it's due yeah. to the difference is due to um, the fact that GPSA does require positional attention, whereas the usual self attention used in the VIT only uses content attention. Yep, um, we will uh, definitely get to that. Uh, get to that point. Um, cool. So that's the. So I guess that's the main idea. Um, the main idea is we we try and in this paper as well in Convid, we see that it is uh, another one of those papers that have come out using vision transformers but um, this idea of having this layer which initially acts like a CNN and then it's up to the layer on itself like it's not something that's hard coded because lots of networks they hard code this uh, and and they make this uh, as a requirement is that the earlier layers are CNN and the later layers are attention. And this is how, and this is how this convict paper is just so different. Um, and, and one of the, I believe one of the most interesting um, lines of research in, in recent papers. Yeah, maybe I can add something um, before we go into the details, uh, which we don't really discuss in the paper, but maybe the, the uh, one advantage and one drawback that we haven't mentioned in the paper. So one easy criticism you can make of the convict is that it's a bit of a waste for the layers which do remain convolutional in the end to be parameterized as self-attention layers because clearly convolutions are much more efficient uh, computationally. And, and so it's a bit, you could say it's a bit of a waste to have a, an attention layer acting as a CNN. However, there is one um, thing that I think it, uh, is better in convert than in hybrid models. And perhaps it explains the good performance is um, the fact that uh, typically uh, the optimizers and high parameters you use for CNNs are quite different from those you, that you use for transformers. For example, for transformers, you're typically going to use uh, adaptive optimizers like Adam, whereas for, for CNNs, you generally use the SGD with Mentum. And um, so that's, I think, incurs probably some limitations in hybrid models where you can't sort of uh, um, use a hybrid optimizer, right? So, so in this sense, the convert is a sort of unified framework between convolutions and, and transformers. Mm, that 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 really does make sense, and I think that's also a good point to think of in terms of drawback of of the GPSA. That um, if if in the end it's going to, and from experiments, if we know that it's going to stay convolution, then why should we have all these extra parameters that it starts with self attention? Um, cool. We I think that's something that we'll discuss uh, for everybody, uh, we'll discuss as we go through the paper. And if there's um, anything that you don't understand, please uh, feel free to keep posting your questions. We will, we will address them as we go. Uh, so in terms of introduction of the paper, uh, the introduction when I've, um, and I'm, this is all based on my understanding, um, the introduction just mentions that there's, there's pretty much two types of, of either there's two types of research. Um, and it, one of the main things that this introduction says is that the inductive biases are hard coded into the architectural structure of CNNs. Um, we have locality and we have weight sharing. So I think at this point, um, I think at this point it might make sense to to actually just um, Stefan, if you do agree, maybe we spend just two or five minutes just looking at the basic differences of what exactly a convolution is and what how exactly are these um, are these inductive biases hard coded and then what exactly is uh, is is attention so if I go in this I, I do have an image a, a very small image that that might help explain this idea um, so in a convolution uh, and and Stefan please feel free feel free to correct me um, as I've said um, so you have this you have this input image let's say it's a very small image. actually might need a little bit bigger. So let's just say that's just one uh, small part of the image. Uh, so then this, if this, if this is my convolution kernel, let's say this is a three by three convolution kernel. So it's a three by three. 
and my input image is say two to four uh, by two to four. Uh, then something that happens in, in 2D convolutions is that this convolution kernel will go um, pretty much like that all over the image. Um, and I guess one of the main things is that these weights that get learned for the convolution kernels, they, they are sort of shared throughout all over the image. Um, is that, a, is that a good understanding? And then is that why you mentioned in the paper that um, it's sort of like a hard inductive bias in, in convolution? Yep, yep. So that's the weight sharing constraint. And then of course, there's the fact that the convolutional kernel is only three by three, so it can't directly extract the long range dependencies. Yeah, um, so in that one, I guess uh, the point is that when we have a layer two, which which after if we apply a convolution uh, to, to this layer one, um, so let's say the layer one is the image, um, then at, at a certain point if the convolution kernel is only three by three, then this particular, it's called a receptive field. Um, and in terms of the receptive field, it can only have a look at this, this part of the image. So all of this on the other side, um, all of the other part of the image is never looked at by this, by this particular pixel of this um, second layer. So it doesn't really have any visibility um, to the other side of, of the image. Um, this thing is, is it's something that gets taken away from in terms of an attention. Um, so the way I, I think we've, the way I like to uh, think of attention and, and the way I like to think um, how this is different is that um, if I have an input image X um, and I have three matrices, I have my, let's say my weight query, my weight K and my weight value. Um, when these three get multiplied, I get three matrices again. So this one I'm going to call Q, this one I'm going to call K and this one I'm going to call V. Um, how this is different is that in attention, if this is the pixel that I'm trying to look at, then everything else around the image becomes my query. So this pixel, if this, if this becomes my query, sorry, everything around becomes the key. And then we find, let's just think of it this way, we find a weighted combination. So if, if the value, um, this is how this uh, understanding of attention goes, is that let's say the value is, is the actual, uh, in terms of understanding is the representation of this, of this input image. So this is what represents this input image. Um, and when we're trying to look at a particular part of the image, let's say over here, we want to understand how much attention or how much stress does this particular pixel need to look at all the other um, parts of the image to, to have a, to, to then come up with. Um, so if, if there's an image of a dog here and there's an image of a dog over here, then these two would, would have sort of a, a high attention value because then it's important to know that this picture could that be of dogs. Um, so in that sense, then what you have is you have your query, uh, you have your query and your key. So every other pixel becomes the key, and then you have a weighted combination of these, which is called attention. And you multiply that by the value to get your final output. So the way how this is different is that there's no receptive field. Like when we have a when we have a convolution. Um, this one particular pixel can only have a look at this three by three, if it's a three by three kernel, but this sort of constraint is, is taken away in attention. Um, is that, is that uh, correct, Sifan? Is there something you want to add to this? Yeah. Or? Yeah, this is Actually, uh, in attention, you also have um, weight sharing in some sense because you use the same Q and K for different positions. So yeah, it's really the, uh, the receptive field, which is widened. And, and the fact that you, um, in some sense, the, the filters are dynamically generated for attention, whereas for the CNNs, they're fixed. Hmm, thank you. Um, so uh, with that being said, I think the, uh, the reason why I quickly wanted to touch in this um, is because as we go along this uh, understanding of, at least for me as well, when I was first reading the paper, um, this understanding of just understanding that a CNN is, is somewhat local um, and has these hard inductive biases, whereas attention is not, um, it really helped me as we, as we will go through the, as we'll go through the paper. So this question that, um, Recently, there's been more and more papers uh, on, on that are based purely on attention. So the whole network, there's no convolutional 
uh, part to it. Um, the whole paper is based on attention. And this brings into the question, do we really need these hard-coded inductive biases that we just discussed in terms of weight sharing and um, the receptive field? So over here, as you um, find, is this just a prior reference that says, um, we know that we found from past research that it, it really works if the earlier layers are convolutional and the, and the later layers are attention. Excellent. Um, cool. So then I guess uh, at this point, then we start happy to look, uh, look into the soft inductive biases and we, we're happy to start um, going forward. But is there anything that else that you want to add uh, so far, uh, Stefan? Yeah, that's a good sum summary. Okay. Excellent. Um, so then I guess when I was reading this paper, uh, I, I sort of understood this in a way that a convolutional neural network has these hard inductive biases that, that actually are part of the, the, the convolution kernel, like because of the weight sharing and these um, things. Then I guess one of the questions, um, one of the questions that get asked here, Uh, one of the questions is that these things forcefully induce the convolutional inductive biases into transformers, uh, potentially affecting the transformer with the limitations. Um, so sorry, when I say these things, let's go into this a little bit more. Um, so because we know that from, from past research, one of the best ways is, is to sort of combine a CNN and attention and then CNN in the earlier layers and attention in the late, uh, later layers. Um, there's, there's basically two ways. One is the hybrid model. And the second one is, is knowledge distillation that got used in diet. Let me see if I can find where it says, oh, here it is. Uh, did you want to, uh, Stefan, did you want to uh, introduce everybody to what um, these two approaches are and how they're different? Yeah. Um, so as we said, hybrid models is really just stacking uh, self attention layers onto into compilational layers. Uh, knowledge distillation is a bit different. Um, the way they use it in, in uh, transformer papers is that uh, essentially you have a, a teacher, which is a, um, typically here going to be a convolutional network, which is going to give you some soft labels. So it's not going to give you hard labels as in uh, one hot encoded vectors. It's not going to say this is a dog. It's going to say this is 98% of dog, uh, 94, etc. Uh, well, actually, that's how uh, the knowledge transform uh, knowledge distillation usually works. What's surprising is that in the way it's generally used for transformers, the teacher actually gives hard labels, and and that seems to be enough to give the student uh, uh, strong inductive bias. Um, and actually, we observed this in our paper. I think it's in uh, an appendix. We show that the uh, the student which learns from a convolutional teacher, the student transformer which learns from a uh, um, a uh, convolutional teacher does uh, have a more local inductive bias at the end of training, hmm. which is very surprising. How, like, how can you get a convolutional inductive bias just out of, of hard labels? It's very surprising, but that, that seems to be the case. Yeah, it, it does seem surprising. And I, I think there was this recent paper that came out like um, from, from Google research about knowledge distillation that a, a, a teacher should be patient and and they sort of use soft inductive biases, but that's again from a convolutional to a convolutional um, sort of student teacher process, not not to a transformer instead. Um, but that's, I guess, um, then that's the main idea. And this is uh, discussed in, I believe the diet data efficient um, image transformer. It was, that was the one of the first papers to then uh, bring this distillation token and bring sort of knowledge distillation to, to image transformers. Um, but the idea is, uh, the, the idea is to have these, what these hybrid and knowledge distillation models do is, um, with vision transformers, one thing that we've seen is that they have to have this really long pre-training on a, on a lot of data. Uh, so, so for example, the, the initial vision transformer, um, Stefan, correct me, but was it the GFD 300 million images that it was trained on? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's a lot of pre-training and then is that correct that what um, these approaches of having like a hybrid and knowledge distillation do is they, they try and take away that requirement of having really long pre-training and having these really expensive uh, compute requirements so you can actually yeah. um, still not, not have to train on 300 million images? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And to me, the knowledge distillation is sort of, it's not ideal in the sense that, well, for two reasons. First of all, you know, you, you require a teacher, so you have to have a forward pass of the teacher each time at each training step uh, to get the correct label. And also it's a bit surprising that it works well with these hard labels because essentially uh, the best you can get from the teacher, I mean, all, uh, all you can get from the teacher is basically a, a wrong a wrong label like either the teacher gives the right label and then you already had the, the token of the right label or it gives you a wrong la label and although that seems to ease training it's actually um it's you know it's giving you bad information so it's, it's to me it's not an ideal um practice despite yeah, I, it's, it's in break or success yeah I'm completely with you on this. And like, I think one of the questions I've had as well is, so maybe it might make sense that we just spend five minutes on um, discussing this distillation side of things and why it's not a good approach is, I think you mentioned that the, you mentioned that um, it's possible that the, the only thing it can do is give a wrong label. Um, so basically, I guess, just to make things a little bit clear is when you have your input image, then if let's say you have 1 million such images, then you also have 1 million corresponding labels. So this could be a label two and the last one could be a label 10 where two could mean that of a fish and 10 could mean that of a dog. That's just the categories. Um, so something that happens is, so these becomes my true labels. So this class token is trying to minimize the loss between uh, basically the class embedding and this true labels, whereas this uh, distillation token is trying to minimize this loss again the cross entropy loss between um, this this sort of uh, so you have a teacher teacher model um, let's say this teacher model is something that's really massive really big and it's a really good uh, it, it might have like a 89 percent I think uh, previously people have uh, in, in papers that have said uh, read they've used regnet and what you do is then for all of these, you make predictions using the teacher model. So you get another set of, not the true labels, but let's just call them pseudo labels or something. Um, but you also get this set of labels. And if you have the right labels for all of them, then there's no difference in the true label and the pseudo label. But the only thing that you can get is that the teacher can predict wrong. So instead of a two, it could predict a four. Um, and this way of having these numbers associated to each is called a hard label. Um, so I guess, does this sort of summarize uh, well that this is why a, a teacher approach might not be really good is because first you need to have a teacher model which might work for ImageNet, but say if you wanna work for a medical data set or you wanna work on a different data set, they might not be that good a teacher model present. And then secondly, like it can only give you wrong labels. So why does this work? That's again, maybe a question that hasn't been answered, answered properly. So how does Convit do it different, um, Stefan? I, I, I do have the answer, but did you want to take a minute and just say like, it doesn't, does it not do any knowledge distillation or how is Convit then different? Yeah, it's, it's really to, to plug in the, the convolutional inductive bias in the architecture rather than sort of pull it, pull it out of a um, convolutional teacher. Hmm. So, so I guess then it doesn't go this hybrid model path and it doesn't go this knowledge distillation path, but it goes down this path of having the earlier layers as GPCA, uh, GPSA, I keep calling it GPCA, um, and the later layers as, as, as say CNN blocks. And as you mentioned, there's like 14 or 16, depending on how big um, the architecture is. And then this has the inductive, like the soft, like soft inductive bias instead of like a hard inductive bias. Um, and you found, so we, when we were looking at this, this was the diet, basically this is what the diet paper did and they had knowledge distillation. Um, and, and from figure two, is this something that you found Stefan is that it was performing better than diet and did you wanna maybe shed some light on the experiments in the initial experiments that you um, failed and did you wanna uh, explain so, this image? So the, the right panel is is just to check that, you know, the, the convert still works well on the, on the original task, so ImageNet, it's you know slightly better than the DIT with the same hyperparameters, but but that's not the key point. The read the key point about the uh, the convert is to sort of get the best of both both worlds between the CNNs, which are really good in the low data regime, and the transformers, which are better with a lot of data. And as you can see, um, the gap between the on the left panel here, you can see that the gap between the convert and the DIT grows 
as you have less and less uh, images in your training set. And so that's really showing that the, the whole point of these GPSA layers, and you also see this in the ablation at the end of the paper, uh, when you don't have much data, the, the inductive biases really kick in and really help you get better performance. They kind of save you from, um, yeah, uh, from under uh, overfitting the data set, yeah. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I guess then let's quickly have a look at, uh, I'm trying to find where the contribution section went. I think it's a, cause this is the recent version. Um, and the one I have printed out is, is a different one. Um, but let me see, oh, here it is. So then again, we've already looked at this. Then the main contributions are this, this gated positional self-attention. And then um, we, we the, the, there's a comparison on diet. And then also we, we look at why this, this convert works later. So let's uh, quickly get down this path. Um, so I'm just gonna skip this uh, mathematics of, of self-attention, uh, but it's, it's basically, uh, actually this is something that, that might be, that might be important um, in terms of uh, in terms of the understanding. Um, so I'm just going to take uh, Stefan. I'm going to take quickly a minute uh, to try and explain what relative position attention is. But is that something did you want to do and just spend uh, some time introducing this this particular equation? Uh, so yeah, I can I can quickly comment it. So um, if, so this equation four, uh, it's unusual. The usual attention you have in division transformers is the same equation, but without the the V times R. And so the idea in this equation four is that you have these two terms. The first one is the usual term. And basically to, to evaluate the attention between a pixel I and a pixel J, it's just gonna look at their, their values. So the, the QI, which is the embedding of pixel, of, so not pixel, uh, patch I and the embedding of patch J. So it really depends only on their, their content, their pixels. Um, whereas the second term V, times Rij is gonna depend only on their relative positions. And so Rij is basically gonna be a, a vector telling us how the, the patches are located with respect to each other. And the V is a vector which is learned by the, the convert um, to determine how much attention should be paid uh, depending on the, the relative position of the patches. Hmm. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Old. Uh, so something that we've seen in the vision transformer is that each patch gets this uh, sort of a position embedding get get associated to it um, because that transformer on its own, and I'm just trying to summarize that the transformer on its own doesn't really have any idea of which patch is at which position, which which could be helpful. Um, then this idea was for attention is that if you're looking at this uh, query, then looking at how far away the, the key sort of patches like I think that's that's just a way of looking at how relative uh, th that's a way of looking at like relative relative position and then of course if if a patch is too far away then is it going to have a different sort of attention than a patch that's right next to um, that's right next to the query patch um, is, is that a so far a good summary of of relative position embeddings yeah, yeah. So the, the the big difference with the usual positional embeddings, which are used in the VIT, is that in the the VIT you have absolute position embedding. So um, if you have uh, n patches, there are n of them. Whereas here we use relative um, position embedding. So there are actually n squared of them. They model all the relative positions of two patches. Did you want to? Um... In terms of like n squared, this is something even I have a question about. Is when you say like. I think this this comes down in the in the paper as well. Right next, um, is that in terms of when you say n square, could you maybe help me also understand or when you say it's n square uh, relative position embeddings and why that number n square comes about? Yeah, so uh, the way you usually do positional embedding is essentially to, for each patch you just add a little vector which characterizes its absolute position. So it's going to say this patch is in the top left, this patch in the top right. Whereas here, uh, what we really care about is not the absolute position of the patch, but how each patch is related to each other patch. And you need much more information to describe all the, the pairwise uh, positions than just the absolute positions. So uh, there are n squared pairs of patches. So that's n squared positional embeddings. Perfect. Um, thank you very much. So then I guess, uh, then I guess that brings us um, to this uh, question or uh, to this point where our self-attention is actually in a way it's it's 
I think there was uh, this research done in this past paper by uh, Courtney et al. that shows that a multi-head positional self uh, position PSA layer uh, positional self attention layer um, can actually work like a like any can actually express any convolution layer of filter size um, under NH by NH. So I guess in a in in a in a general transformer, what we have, and I'll, I'll try and um, summarize this, but I'll draw the image and then maybe Stefan, did you wanna did you wanna uh, sort of spend some time and just explain uh, what this means? Um, so what what I guess that means is if you have an input image and this at the center is my query, um, and let's say I have nine attention heads because um, in, in typically in, in a transformer you have multi-headed self-attention. So then if each attention head starts to look at these points around the query, then in a way it's it's actually acting like a three by three convolution kernel. Is this something that you wanna uh, explain uh, on top of Stefan? And um, is, that a, is that a good summary of, of that paper? Okay, um, so then that's the main idea that, that any, uh, like uh, th this research in the past in 2019 by Coordinate at all, it, it, it shows that it's, that it's actually very possible if, if these, uh, if there's if these uh, self attention layers with with nine heads or sixteen heads or basically n heads uh, n number of heads are sort of initialized with a with with certain amount of parameters in that case then if you can make each attention head pay attention to these these pixels around the query pixel then you can actually make it work like a uh, under root n by under root n. Uh, convolution kernel. So if it's nine, it's like a three by three kernel. If it's 16, it's a four by four kernel. And then this is pretty much how you tend to initialize these. Um, like this is from, again, that previous paper, which, which says that if you initialize these uh, attention layers in, a, in, in this way, then you can actually make it behave like a convolutional uh, layer in the beginning. So was this one of the main sort of inspirations, Stefan, is that from, from this paper is how you got the idea of, okay, maybe let's try and initialize these, these early, um, the, these early layers as, as a, as a convolution and then see how we go. Was that the discussion? Please actually tell us more. Pay, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and actually to pay credit to the authors, they, they probably would have done it themselves if, there was already the DIT around at the moment where they were, they they investigated this, and if they had the, the compute resource to to test it, this it's a very natural idea. Hmm. Um. Yeah, it does feel very natural that, I mean, if if, if you think of it, it does feel very natural that it makes sense. Because we've all seen in this in this various lines of research that the earlier layers are convolution, so it, it does feel natural that why doesn't we we why don't we initialize it in a way that that it sort of learns whether it, it wants to stay convolutional or not or like how far away. Um, so so then I guess uh, the one of the another things that that matters here is this is this alpha which is this convolutional initialization so in this image we have this this alpha is here um did you want to maybe uh explain stefan is like how this this alpha parameter is important and how it's learned uh in the network yeah. so the alpha parameter basically tells how focused uh, the attention is on one patch so as aman was saying uh, if you want a convolutional configuration ideally you want the uh, each attention head to pay only attention to one patch well, you can have a soft version of that if you want, because attention can can you know um, look over a broader area. And essentially, how focused the uh, attention is around one pixel is determined by alpha. So if you have a large alpha, you only pay attention to one pixel. And if you have a, a smaller alpha, then it's going to be broader distributed around the the pixel of interest. Thank you. Um. Yeah, this was another key. One of the things I was really uh, trying to understand is like how is this alpha actually affecting things. But now that you put it, it does it does really help uh, my understanding as well. It's like if you have a smaller alpha, then you're looking at a bigger net, bigger area around the pixel. Whereas when you have a when you have a much bigger alpha, then you're looking at a much smaller and much concentrated area around the pixel. So the so the attention is much more concentrated. 
um, to a specific region. And if you look at this case here, uh, what's what's also nice with this is it, it allows us to have kernels of uh, even um, size because um, if you think of kernels, it's a bit awkward to do a, a, a um, convolution with a two by two kernel, right? Because the the kernel has to can't be centered around the, the query pixel, whereas here it's all right because basically we can do a two by two uh, kernel simply by kind of focusing on the corner of the of the query pack pixel. So essentially, you're you're paying attention to the neighboring uh, patches to the corner, and we can also do a four by four um, convolutional, but that's that's awkward with uh, uh, usual kernels. So yeah, that's also a curious yeah, thing about it. Hmm. That's a really key insight. Um, exactly. So in a CNN, if you have this as a in a as as my sort of the pixel that I'm trying looking at the convolution around, then in terms of a four by four, like how do you make make sure that this is at the center of that of that convolution, basically? But whereas in attention, is it's it's much better or this it's it's much easier to do so if we just keep looking at the pixels around it. Then is is that um, a good summary? Yeah. Of, of what you just uh, yeah what I'm yeah what I meant is just basically that if you um if you have a two by two kernel you can't center that around the the query patch with usual convolutions right because you're either on on one corner or uh, whereas here you can really do a two by two convolution right yeah because you're either here or here or here which is always the where the colon is but in attention um in this way it's possible okay um in in that with, with that being said, then um, when I read the paper, then these equations are how you pretty much initialized um, the early attention layers, and that led to uh, that led to GPS, uh, the gated positional self attention. But there's two two main differences that you've that you've added um, from what I could see in the approach, and uh, one of them was this. Uh, so one of them was this idea of atten adaptive attention span, uh, and the second one this positional gating. So um, the sort of the equations get updated. But did you want to maybe uh, introduce everybody to, to this? Like, why did you have to update or change things, and um, how did you come about to to then coming to the GPSA? Uh, yeah, so I didn't really change the equations, but I just simplified them a bit. So yeah. The idea behind the positional gating is that, okay, we want our um, self-attention to be initialized uh, as a convolution, but we also want it to escape this configuration, right? If it wants to learn more complex dependencies between pixels. And so if you want to go on the positional gating equation, I think it's equation uh, six, probably. Yeah. So if you look at equation seven, the idea is to basically split these, this content term and this position term apart. And then we're basically going to weigh their importances with a gating parameter. So initially, we only want the content, uh, sorry, the positional part, right? Because we only want to pay attention to how the pixels are related to each other. And then throughout training, the gating parameter is going to allow us to discard this positional term if we need to, and to pay more attention to the actual content of the pixels. Mm. Um, yeah, that, that's the main and that's the core idea of, of the whole paper, right? And if, if we can all get this core idea, I think that's it. That's the, we've, we've understood this, this paper really well. Um, so you mentioned content and position terms. Um, so if I go back to, uh, if I go back to this, this equation four, um, we, when we were having a look at attention, there's, there's basically these two terms. One is a query and key sort of interaction. Um, so when, when, if this is my query key and, and value matrices, then if this is my patch and I'm looking at, at other patches, then that's a content to content interaction. Um, but whereas in this one, I'm always just looking at, at the relative position as, as I mentioned in terms of when we were looking at relative position. So this is a content to content and this is a position to position interaction. Um, and it does a soft max, it does a soft max after adding the two um, but the way in this, uh, how this is how this is different is that that equation in a way that still remains the same, but the but initially we're paying um, this much weight to the position, and we're paying one minus well sig is that just a sigmoid parameter? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, and then we're paying one minus um, sigmoid times well lambda h. So lambda h is lambda h is the gating parameter. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So we're paying one minus lambda h times 
weight to to this term. So th this equation is still, as Stefan has mentioned, that he didn't really change the equation, but he, he still, he just sort of uh, made it simple, is that initially, because we want, and, and I'm just trying to summarize for, for my understanding as well, is that because initially we want um, the, we, we want these um, attention layers to act like convolution kernels. So we want to sort of initialize them in that way. That, that means that you're actually going to pay more uh, sort of uh, weight to the to the relative position because a, a convolution has a receptive field and the position of uh, the actual pixels matters a lot more. Um, but then as we go and as this uh, as the network learns, then over time what we want to do is we want to go away from from this uh, sort of uh, paying more attention to to position, but then also start paying to to content. Um, and that's that that's just the main equation. Is that is that correct, Stefan? And then that brings us to this image. So then how is Convit different? Um, did you, I, I believe this image will, will actually then just summarize and everything that we've learned so far will come together in this image. Yeah, so um, what it illustrates is just the fact that we, um, we have basically just a vision transformer where we replace the self-attention layers by uh, GPSA layers. And um, what you can see with the class token is that um, the class token is only injected into the, uh, the patches after the GPSA layers. And the reason for that is that there's, I mean, you could, but there's not a very natural way to do self-attention um, or at, at least positional self-attention with a class token because the class token doesn't carry any positional uh, information, right? It's not part of the image. And this is the reason why we, we inject the class token later, but it's actually, also what uh, more recent transformers do, if you look at the, um, the Kate models by uh, going deeper with uh, transformers, they also inject the class token after a few layers, um, which seems to improve performance. Yeah, and they call it, I think uh, they differentiate between a self yeah. and a class attention or they call it class embedding. I did yeah. have a look. Interesting. Um, so that's, I guess in terms of that, that's the main gist of the paper, um, but I'll quickly go and have a look in case anybody has has any questions so far. Um, so that so if we've, is there anything else that you want to add, Stefan, in terms of the main understanding and the main summary of the paper, or would that feel is, is... okay? Um, in in this case, then we we do welcome questions, and I do want to ask, like, if you have any questions, then please go to this URL one db dot me slash convert. Um, so let me go there and just have a look if there's um, questions so far. Okay. Um, so question is why latter layers are for attention in the hybrid models. Stefan, did you want to take that one? Um, so yeah, the idea is that uh, if you think of the usual intuition that the deeper that you go in the layers, the more abstract information you have, for example, you know, in the first layer, you extract, you know, um, edges, and then you look at shapes, and then you you have the full objects and try to model the relationships between each other. So in the later layers, basically, you've already extracted your objects in the image, and you want, really want to capture the long range dependencies between these objects. And this is where self attention really comes into play. It's very good at extracting um, dependencies between distant parts of the image. Thank you. Uh, and then the second question that we have is does padding affect uh, inductive bias? Um, I don't think so. Um, padding is just a, a more of a sort of mathematical um, artifact sort of, yeah, actually there's a recent paper about that. Uh, Mind the pad it's called, um, which, which studies that, that question shows that padding can actually uh, be detrimental in some cases, but um, I haven't read it in detail. Um, thank you. I haven't heard of this Mind the pad, but uh, I'll, I will have a look. Um, then the next question is, are these models robust to distribution uh, shift? Any experiments in ImageNet C, ImageNet R? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, in fact, uh, we haven't done the experiments ourselves. However, they have been made in, in a recent paper, which is called, um, uh, I think it's called Towards Vision, uh, Robust Vision Transformer. And actually the experiments do show that the Convit has better robustness than the, uh, the DIT, pretty significant actually. Um, and that's kind of interesting. And it's also 
Um, it's also what's appeared in, a, in our latest paper, which came out like three days ago, where we also use GPSA layers, um, but instead of injecting them in, in vision transformers, we actually use these GPSA layers as a reparameterization of convolutional layers inside um, like pre-trained ResNets. Like, because here, essentially what we're doing is we're initializing a transformer as a random convolution, right? Well, you can do the, the idea we explored in our latest paper is to, instead of initialize your uh, self tension your GPSA as a random convolution, initialize it as a pre-trained convolution. And in that case, we also saw that the GPSA layers do improve the robustness. So uh, yeah, that's a great question. Generally speaking, it looks from recent papers that uh, um, self attention layers do bring extra robustness to, to models. Uh, typically, the explanation we have is that they're, they're better at detecting, you know, object contours and, and doing sort of some form of segmentation. So um, that does improve uh, robustness, typically. They're less reliant on the textures and, and, and better at, at detecting shapes. Thank you. Yeah, I, I did see uh, this paper about the um, transformer robustness, and it's another interesting read um, from after, after Convit. Uh, I guess then we'll we'll quickly spend some time uh, based on uh, I, I did also want to touch on this um, uh, table two here that you've that Stefan you've, you from your experiments you saw how um, when we're looking at five percent of the data then Convit actually gets like a forty seven point eight percent top one accuracy compared to a thirty four point eight percent and of course when you're looking at a hundred percent then it's eighty one point four versus a seventy nine point nine. Um, I was just curious, and um, why do you feel is that that's happening? Is that because you've added the convolutional inductive bias, which is important? And yeah, definitely, there's a breakdown of how the the where the performance comes from in the ablation table, uh, which is just a bit further, where we really distinguish the three components of the convert, which are essentially the, uh, the fact that we use positional information, the fact that we use gating, and the fact that we have a convolutional initialization. And so we have these three ingredients. And um, can you go to the table, yeah. uh, the last table? Yeah, there we go, table three. So in that case, you can, so if we start from um, the DIT, which is uh, referenced as E, um, you can see that on 10% of the data sets, um, it has a 47.8 um, performance. And then if we go up in the in the rows, we're basically adding these three ingredients and you see that um, adding the first ingredient, which is the, the GPSA already gives you a pretty big boost, like 7%. But then if you add the um, if you add the gating parameters, um, you, you get another 2% boost. Then adding the convolutional initialization, you get another boost. And then finally, the, uh, um, the whole thing together gets the 59.7. Hmm. I, I think then this paper, uh, this table probably is that a recent addition to the yeah. to the paper. Yeah, uh, I kind of this is all right. This is really interesting to see how these small components then uh, actually affect the, the the performance. So in that case, then yeah. it it does appear just the convolutional initialization seems to have a much bigger effect, right? Of of fifty four percent. Like What's 70%. extremely interesting in this it, it, here also is that we, if you look at the, uh, the figure just below the 47.8, um, essentially what we tried is to use a DIT, but we completely freeze the attention modules, but we uh, initialize them in a convolutional way. And so um, typically this is gonna uh, degrade performance usually. I mean, if you look at uh, the, the column on the left, it goes from 79.1 uh, down to 78.6. But actually, when you have a small amount of data, performance is actually improved. In other words, it's better to have a frozen um, convolution than a trained self-attention when you really don't have much data, which is really surprising. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm still trying to understand. So when you say you froze the attention layers, um, yeah. uh, what we exactly? Train them. So we, we yeah. train uh, the, so these 12, these 10 GPSA layers, we keep them fixed throughout training and we only train the two final self tension layers. And, ah. and uh, what's really surprising is that um, if you freeze these, these, all these layers and, uh, but you use the convolutional initialization, it actually gives you better performance than 
training, but without the computational initialization. That really is an interesting insight. Yeah, um, it goes together with all these, you know, these ideas of, um, of does, does, is attention really necessary? The idea that, um, you know, we, we think that we're doing something really clever with these self-attention layers, but probably the most important thing is not the way we extract, we sort of exchange information between um, patches, but the fact that information flows at all. It sort of goes together with that paper, the NF, uh, the FNET paper, where they use, uh, they simply mix tokens with a, a Fourier layer, which isn't even trained, but that seems to work pretty well. In other words, it doesn't really matter how the, the, the tokens are, are mixed together, as long as they are mixed together effectively. Um, in terms of the, I think the, like in terms of the only thing that that kind of did, uh, and I'm conscious of time as well, but I guess this is the probably uh, the last thing that we will touch upon if there's uh, no more questions. Um, there is one, um, but then I guess one thing I did kind of feel when I was reading this paper, which was against my intuition, is that, um, you know, it does make sense to then have the initial layers initialized as 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 CNNs and then the later layers as um, as self attention. I mean, even then, in terms of like a top one accuracy, um, it, it's around eighty two point four, eighty two point five, I believe. Whereas if you if we look at the uh, kite or like they go as up as eighty six percent, is that why do you think that's like what's the difference? And then is there any future versions that you're planning or there's more research coming? Um, were you going to try and bridge the gap or was that not the idea to actually even look at top one, but just do this experiment? Yeah, so I think the, the key point, I, we didn't really want to push the model to the limit in terms of like maximal top one, because um, the, the key point of the paper really was the sort of um, sample efficiency. It's basically getting vision transformers to work on any kind of data set and introduce this idea of soft um, convolutional inductive bias. Um, if you look at the Kate, probably the differences between Kate and DIT or com Combit, um, I'd say, well, of, of course, the depth, which gives you higher expressivity. Um, and then pretty much the, the training tricks they introduce. Um, so this, this idea of, of uh, mixing with the class token later in later layers. Um, and there's also that idea that uh, using layer scale, uh, which essentially is using um, using a sort of residual connection, but uh, with a weight, which tells you how to mix the, the residual together with the, the normal path. And so, yeah, um, a couple of training tricks, which which make a big difference. But um, I think the key point of convert is really the sample efficiency. Thank you. Um, I guess then that brings us to uh, one of the last questions uh, for the day is, why does, oh, sorry, that makes it two questions. Um, but the first one is, why does Adam Optimizer work better in attention layers, but not in convolution. I don't think we did say that. Is that something, did you mention, Stefan? Is that apt to mention at the beginning when I said that hybrid models are a bit finicky to train because uh, yeah. they, yeah, because, um, and so, okay, there's a paper which studies this in details, in detail, which is easy to find the title of something like um, uh, why Adam uh, works better for attention layers. Um, so the, I think the insight they give in the paper is the fact that um, typically SGD with men momentum is going to uh, create long tailed gradients. Um, and so you can solve this by clipping gradients, but there was something related to the distribution of the gradients. Um, the very hand wavy way I like to think about this, but it's pro probably wrong, but uh, my intuition is that generally speaking, the self attention mechanism uses very different components. It has the, the Q, the K, and the V matrices, and then it has the, the projection to the output. These are sort of qualitatively different um, matrices. And in, in such a case, I think it's useful to have an adaptive optimizer because you don't necessarily need the same learning rate for these different parts. Whereas um, for usual networks like convolutional networks, you all the, the components are rather similar and, and um, and so, but that's just my intuition, uh, have no evidence for that. Uh, so I refer you to that paper. Uh, why does Adam work better for, for attention layers? Thank you. Uh, I, I hope that answers the question. And then we, it, it is um, the last question of the day. If initial layers end up being closer to CNNs, uh, by the end, 
of CNNs aren't we having a higher receptive field almost throughout the whole image? Um, uh, yeah, so that's a good question. So one thing you could, um, so it's true that one simplification we often make with transformers is saying that um, they're, they benefit from capturing long range dependencies. It is true that CNNs also can capture long range dependencies because if you cascade convolutions one after the other, information does end up flowing through the, the whole image. Um, but uh, the key difference I think with self-attention is that every single layer has access to every part of the, of the representation at the given layer. Whereas in CNNs, um, you know, after eight layers, we're gonna indeed have information about all the parts of the image, but not of the current activation, rather of the original image. And so maybe that's the, the slight difference between CNNs and transformers. But again, this is an interesting question, which definitely needs a paper in itself. Totally. Um, that being said, thanks very much, Stefan, for finding the time and talking and discussing the Convit paper with us. Um, really thankful to you as well. And I do want to mention is that initially when I had some questions about Convit, I did reach out to Stefan and he was very helping uh, to answer all questions for me. Um, and even today, he's taken out the time for, for finding and answering all the questions from everybody else. So thanks very much for doing that. We really appreciate um, you helping us with with the convert paper and um, wish you good luck for the next uh, next uh, coming lines of research that you end up taking. Yeah, great pleasure. And, and thanks for implementing the convert on um, on Tim, and that's re very useful. Uh, so if anybody wants to play around with it, you can just download it easily from from the PyTorch image models package. Yeah, that's something I should quickly mention. I, I guess that's a really good way of of closing this. So if anybody wants to uh, experiment with uh, with convert. Um, it, it's already part of this uh, li library called PyTorch image models. So pretty much you can just say tim.createModel and say convert and it will create the model for you. So you can actually run all your experiments and try all of the things that we've, we've mentioned today. Thanks everybody. See you next week.